Terror and Thunder, the new Dino Discoveries, reported by Pete Wilson. For the next few minutes, you'll have to suspend all your notions of great size. For our purposes, think of elephants and whales as comparatively small. Imagine creatures longer than three whales stretched head to tail and heavier than ten African elephants, monsters whose heads swayed where flying creatures soared. Right now, paleontologists in Utah are cleaning, piecing together, studying the bones of what are believed to be super giant dinosaurs. A patasaurus, or about half the size of what he would have been 135 million years ago. Dinosaurs like this one, Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, and so on, were roughly 35 to 40 feet tall and 75 to 90 feet long and were considered the largest creatures ever to roam the Earth until scientists began uncovering bones that were much larger. Well, once we discovered that we had, in fact, like you say, supergiant dinosaurs, that is sauropods, which are large dinosaurs anyway, the largest, and these are even bigger, the biggest of the largest, that over the past several years, we've discovered uh, a number of these new forms. And where we are is trying to piece them together and figure out which is which and how many new forms we have. We feel that there are at least three now and possibly more. Even the names given to these specimen types conjure up images of enormous size. Ultrasaurus, Supersaurus, and the most recent of the fossil discoveries, a behemoth called Seismosaurus, the Earth Shaker, which lived about 145 million years ago. Figuratively speaking, it would shake the ground, and so that was the origin for the name Seismosaurus, the Earth Shaker. Dr. David Gillette is the state paleontologist of Utah. He's leading a team that's digging up the skeleton of a Seismosaurus at a secret desert site in New Mexico, some 60 miles northwest of Albuquerque. But it is here at a laboratory in Provo, Utah, in the shadow of the Wasatch Mountains, that scientists are attempting to reconstruct the fossil record of the supergiants. This is the Earth Science Museum at Brigham Young University, the largest paleontology lab in the West. This vertebrae has been uh, previously described as one of the anterior caudal vertebrae of Supersaurus, probably the first or second vertebrae behind the hips in the tail. And it's a huge vertebrae. Ken Statman is the keeper of the bones at the lab. Supersaurus was the first of the giants to be discovered. A few neck and tail bones and a pelvis have been found since the discovery in 1972 near Carson City, Colorado. Seven years later, in the same general area, the shoulder blade of the Ultrasaurus was uncovered. Comparing those extraordinary bones with those of a well-known relative, Brachiosaurus, renowned paleontologist Jim Jensen fashioned the model of this Ultrasaurus front leg. The leg is 25 feet long. The shoulder blade is 9 feet long alone. This is a cast, but it's an actual replica of the bone. You can see how big it is. But building a whole creature from these fragmentary skeletons is like trying to imagine what a chicken is based on drumsticks and a wishbone. That's why the new Seismosaurus discovery is so promising. Dr. Gillette believes he has a whole skeleton, and it's intact. We have about half the skeleton out of the ground. About 20% um, of those bones are prepared for study, and, and we can make comparisons. The very size of the bones are posing new engineering challenges for the excavators. The bones are lying on their side, ribs are attached, there are eight bones still all connected, and they're uh, arranged in a, a long bread loaf-like uh, shape as we've excavated around the sides. The next step is to undercut that block and begin to uh, apply plaster and burlap underneath uh, and prepare that block for moving out of the quarry. But that block is as long as a pickup truck, almost as wide, and it's going to weigh about uh, 10 tons. Gillette figures Seismosaurus weighed about 80 tons and was at least 120 feet long, possibly even longer. Let's talk about size for just a minute. This is the business end of a fin whale. In the wild, we'd find them roughly 50 feet long, give or take a couple of feet. And it's more in line with our notions of size in the wild at its maximum. But now we're going to talk about dinosaurs and creatures much longer than that fin whale. Roughly here would be the size, for instance, of an apatosaurus. And again, something that's 40 feet tall. Here, the size of a diplodocus. But now, now we talk about the discovery of the seismosaurus. 
something that is 120 to 25 feet long, and that's a conservative estimate. I'd have to keep walking to here and five feet farther. In a comparison with the estimated size of Ultrasaurus and of Supersaurus, Seismosaurus may turn out to be the longest dinosaur that ever lived, the largest creature that ever lived. The jury is still out on which dinosaur was the biggest. The paleontologists in Utah don't expect to complete their studies until sometime around 1993. In a moment, what paleontologists are learning from these giant bones. And later, a creature to rival the terrible T-Rex. This is a neural spine. Contact here, another one here. This one here, one back too. here. Bones of a giant. And then it, Preserved in back. stone, wrapped in Go burlap, back. dipped in plaster. This block, as big as a boulder, contains a few bones, weighing 3,200 pounds of what may well be the longest dinosaur that ever lived. This is just a preliminary artist rendering. Seismosaurus, earth shaker, 80 tons, 120 feet from its head to the end of its tail, possibly even longer. This big flat bone here and, and its, its partner on the other side, there's two of them in the animal, are the ilium, ilia. They're the bones that, uh, when my daughter was little, set her on your hip and carry her around. It's uh, one of the bones that give us a lot of information about the, uh, the load-bearing capacities for this animal. Paleontologist Lynette Gillette is preparing these specimens for study. This is the laboratory of the Earth Science Museum at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Her husband, Dr. So David working. Gillette, is leading a team that is digging up an extraordinary treasure, the virtually complete and connected skeleton of this prehistoric monster in the desert badlands of New Mexico. The task of uncovering the bones of a creature that lived 145 million years ago is a lot more difficult than the word preparing would suggest. We get into having to use power tools for um, chiseling it off inch by inch, and there's always the fear that we're producing a new animal. In other words, sculpting something. I, I have friends who sculpt, and they uh, say, well, this would be easy. You know, what do you want it to look like? Do you want it long and narrow? Or, and we could just carve something out. But uh, the trick is to find the real bone and follow that. Gillette and her colleagues clean the bones using tools like those a dentist would use to clean your teeth. The job takes great patience, a knack for puzzles, jigsaw puzzles composed of fractured, fossilized pieces millions of years old. And sometimes it takes intuition. I use every sense I have. I use my ears, my eyes, um, the bone when you're drilling. If you get the powder in the air, it smells different. Um, there's a bit of an organic I guess that's the word for it, the organic smell that's different than the powdered matrix. These scientists also have made other discoveries about ancient bones that help in distinguishing them from the rock. When wet, the sandstone appears darker. Under black light, ultraviolet light, the bones glow. Why? Minute amounts of radioactive material are carried in the minerals that fossilize the bone. The lab is also preparing the skeletal remains of what are believed to be two other mega-giant dinosaurs, Ultrasaurus and Supersaurus. And once again, the bones have yielded a secret about their great size. Fairly recently, we made an important discovery, at least I feel, and that is that we've gotten the pelvis of Supersaurus. And in preparing it, I found out that it's hollow. And it's like corrugated cardboard, and for the same reason, it's uh, adding strength and reducing weight. So it's probably a weight-saving device to allow it to get that large. Dr. Wade Miller is head of BYU's Earth Sciences Museum and is leading the search for Ultrasaurus and Supersaurus bones. He and Dr. Gillette are now experimenting with new sound techniques, originally developed by Oak Ridge National Laboratory to find buried toxic waste. The methods hold great promise in finding dinosaur bone. And our goal is to be able to see the bones in the ground before we excavate so we know where to excavate. And that's not important for small animals, but it is for big animals where you, there's a tremendous amount of labor involved. The first sound imaging device looks like a lawnmower and works something like sonar. In digging up Seismosaurus, Dr. Gillette is testing the reliability of another method which uses sound waves to make fuzzy images of buried fossils. An array of 29 microphones lowered into a borehole pick up the thunderous blasts of a shotgun on wheels. The system works because the sound waves travel slower through the bones than the surrounding sandstone. A computer converts the sound shadows seen as red blotches in this 3D model into images of the buried dinosaur skeleton. 
Dr. Gillette says the method could cut the time it takes to unearth a dinosaur from 10 to just two years. As one science writer put it, we're hunting for dinosaurs now with shotguns. <laughs> Menace with a capital T, T-Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex. The skull of Tyrannosaurus Rex, perhaps the best known and, uh, and deadliest of all of the dinosaurs. A 45-foot pit bull, a shark on land, the ultimate killing machine. But was it really? Perhaps not, according to Dr. Robert Bacher. Okay, the latest find is Epantereus the gigantic meat eater, the 50-foot uh, carnivorous dinosaur. Millions of years before T. rex, Epentarius amplexus preyed on other dinosaurs. Epentarius is an allosaur. This critter here is a typical allosaur. It's about average size. This will run you a thousand pounds, maybe a ton tops. A formidable creature, great steak knife-like uh, teeth, ripping claws in the, in the hand. But this is a small one. Epentarius was the last of the allosaurs and the largest, twice as high, twice as long as this, weighing in at four or five tons. That's 10 times as big as a gigantic lion. Epentarius amplexus wasn't as heavy as T-Rex, but it was longer and faster and probably even meaner than its ferocious heir. The monster meat eater had hinged jaws so large it could eat a large animal with a single snap of its mouth. Epentarius would have a mouth uh, from ear to chin over four feet long and triple jointed. The jaw could come unhinged here and here and back here so the mouth could open very widely. It could swallow in one gulp a 1,500 pound steer. A team headed by paleontologist Dr. Robert Bacher of the University of Colorado has recently uncovered the jaw bones, the teeth and tail bones of an Epentarius in a fossilized lake bed near Masonville, Colorado, just north of Denver. Other Epentarius bones had been found twice before, in 1877 and during the Depression of the 30s, but they languished in obscurity. Epentarius was king of the beasts 30 million years before the first Tyrannosaurus was born. Why does Dr. Bacher believe Epentarius amplexus is the baddest, the scare you to death dinosaur that ever lived? Epentarius was the only dinosaur strong enough to attack a brontosaurus single-handed. It would be wonderful and horrible to watch. Its mode of killing wasn't a single bite, but repeated bites. It kill, killed by inflicting trauma and blood loss on giant prey. Remember, this animal has to kill brontosaurus. 20 tons or 30 tons of herbivore. Next, a new kind of extinction facing dinosaurs. Fossils, markers in time. Fossil bones have brought dinosaurs back to us, if not in flesh and blood, certainly enough to drive our imaginations about remarkable creatures that survived for 140 million years and disappeared 65 million years before humans appeared. But the odds of dinosaur bones even existing are extremely high. The process has been compared to a recipe that turns out correctly one time out of 10,000. First, the dinosaur must have died where it would be buried quickly and in sediments that permit waterborne material to replace the decaying soft parts of the bone. By one estimate, barely one hundredth of one percent of all the animals that lived in the era of dinosaurs, the Mesozoic era, were preserved at all. So dinosaur bones are a rare, rare treasure. And like any treasure, they have become the targets of pirates, poachers, and vandals. The uh, pressure on dinosaur sites is increasing with the increasing value placed on dinosaur bones. So as a consequence, we have to protect ourselves from the casual vandals who would just collect for personal reasons all the way to those people who would collect for uh, great profit. I do know of uh, collectors going into areas uh, near our field areas in Montana and uh, paying ranchers large sums of money and going in and collecting uh, dinosaurs and offering these for sale on the, on the European market. For paleontologists like Dr. David Gillette, Mark Goodwin of Berkeley, and Dr. Robert Bacher, the challenge isn't just finding dinosaur bones, but finding them and getting them out of the ground before someone else does. There are people who will vandalize sites, come with picks, smash up dinosaur bones, trying to get pretty-looking stained bone, which they'll sell in rock shops. 
And a lot of specimens have been damaged or totally destroyed that way, which is why a lot of paleontologists keep their sites secret. These are the foot bones of a duckbill dinosaur. Tremendous scientific value here, obviously, but the bones aren't just found in museums nowadays. They're found in private homes because they are sold, bought, traded, collected, and in some cases smuggled as fine art. The sale of dinosaur bones is, is uh, frightening. For example, on the market today, there's a, an, a skull of Allosaurus that's two feet long, it's, uh, it's only about half there and the other half has been restored. And it's being advertised in a catalog for $100,000. There's a tremendous market for the sale of dinosaur bones for those who would have treasures for possession, for display. There are companies that legitimately deal in dinosaur bones. This is a catalog from an outfit in Oklahoma. Companies that trade in fossils get their dinosaur bones from private property, say from a farmer or a mining company. That's because it is against the law to collect and sell dinosaur bones from federal land. However, there is also a black market in the fossil trade and the poaching alarms paleontologists. I would say there's a lot of money involved. Whether there's a lot of people doing it right now is, is you know, in relative numbers, exact numbers, is hard to say. I know of vandalism problems from other paleontologists. One occurred here in Utah several years ago where a skeleton had been partially excavated and, uh, and the excavation was shut down for the winter and paleontologists went back uh, next spring and the rest of the skeleton had been removed by somebody who was unscrupulous. That was a horror story. The, the uh, information that should have been retrieved and gone into the public domain instead went into somebody's private collection. A lot of those bones are leaving the country, going to other nations. Sources tell KGO Television that some of these private collectors who get dinosaur bones on the black market include unnamed business executives in Germany and Japan. There is an even darker side to the raids on dinosaur digs. There are some people who consider the fossil record an affront to the teachings of the Bible. There's an element in our society that doesn't believe in evolution. Uh, it's a conservative element that is in opposition to uh, the scientific operations in, in general. And so we have a problem with um, the antagonism between the two groups. And we're the focus of a lot of attention because dinosaurs represent a, a phase of evolution that everybody can re relate to. Dinosaurs are something in the past. They're big, they're easily identified. They represent something that's alien. And they're an easy target, an easy focus. And in turn, paleontologists are an easy target, especially the ones studying dinosaurs. <laughs> Just ahead, more from the scientist who is breathing new life into the dinosaur. It's very challenging to be a paleontologist because you have to ver be very broadly educated. You can't be narrowly focused. You've got to know anatomy, you've got to know some animal behavior, ecology. Dr. Robert Bakker, professor of paleontology at the University of Colorado, modern-day hunter of dinosaurs. Through his artwork, expeditions, and studies, he is revolutionizing our image of the dinosaur. The way I was brought up, dinosaurs came in two colors, gray-green or green-gray. They were stuck in their native swamps. Uh, they could only make a sound like a hiss, and they were slow, plodding, and poor mother. Bakker's groundbreaking book, The Dinosaur Heresies, dispelled almost all of what we have been taught, what he refers to sarcastically as the dinosaurian orthodoxy. In his view, dinosaurs were not dull, skinned, and dim-witted. They were quick, adaptive, thinking creatures, alive with color. A lot of lizards, including local lizards in California or in Colorado, are bright colors. Lizards see in color also. Any animal that sees in color and that courts its mate during the day has to use bright colors to communicate. This is Brontosaurus, to the purest, Apatosaurus, as interpreted by Bakker, not a sluggish, tail-dragging swamp dweller, but an active, practically nimble giant capable of rearing back on its hind legs and tail in a defensive fighting stance. Look at the rib cage of any dinosaur. It's gigantic. Well, the only thing here is the heart and the points of the lungs. You know the hearts were gigantic. You get a cold-blooded plotting animal, you get a giant tortoise, and look, it's its rib cage. It's very small. Tortoises have small hearts and small lungs. So we know that the average level of activity in a dinosaur chest was way up the level of a bird. Very hot-blooded, very active all the time. 
Bakker goes even further in his theories about dinosaurs. To him, the terrible lizards have been mislabeled. It should be dino aves, terrible birds. And the evidence is overwhelming that, our, that birds, and only birds, are direct descendants of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs had eyes which were wired like bird eyes, extremely like birds. The imprint of the optic lobe of the brain and the brain case bones shows that these were very visual animals. The, the socket to the eyeball itself is gigantic, visually acute animals. The holes left by nerves going to and from the eye are gigantic. So this is a gigantic bird eye. If you're thinking of a dinosaur, it's not a gigantic lizard or a gigantic frog or toad or salamander, it's a gigantic bird. Bakker compares T-Rex to a roadrunner able to chase down its prey at 40 miles per hour. His provocative ideas have taken on three dimensions. The paleontologist guides a group of artists and technicians in creating these Mesozoic marvels, such as the Chronosaurus, an underwater dinosaur with a head nine feet long. You go small, medium, medium, big, down to small, get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'll make it even more snaggly toothy. He is the brain trust of a Southern California company called Dynamation. It produces animated, lifelike robotic dinosaurs for museums and exhibitions. But always, always, his primary pursuit is fleshing out the fossil record, trying to understand what dinosaurs really were and sharing those ideas with new generations. I grew up with Roy Chapman Andrews' book, All About Dinosaurs. It was great. It was vivid. It was written by a guy who had been on many expeditions. The chap who had found the, the dinosaur eggs for the first time in the Gobi. So I think every scientist owes it to society to sit down and write right for the second and third grader, about what it's like to discover dinosaurs in the Badlands. Mm -hmm.